Thank you, everybody, for joining us for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. I'm the moderator, and my name is Dustin Angel. I'm the director of education. This is a day where people all over the world are celebrating. It's that time of year that we spend a little time reflecting on our relationship to nature, feeling grateful for the gifts of nature, how it helps sustain us physically and improves our mental, our spiritual, our emotional well-being, and, and also a time to learn about environmental challenges and to find ways we can give back to nature and help our planet. For the next hour, we're going to celebrate the colors of the Florida scrub. Now, I mean that literally, we will be talking about colors in the Florida scrub and the ecosystem, but also the spectrum of experiences from some of our researchers at Archbold Biological Station. We will have four rounds of questions for our panelists. If you have questions or comments, we really want to see them. If you're on Zoom, put your questions in the Q&A section but also write comments throughout the, throughout the whole event. We'd really like to see what you're thinking. For our first round, all of our panelists will answer the same question. As it's each panelist's turn, I'll introduce who they are. We're gonna jump right in here. Our first panelist, Dr. Eric Mangus. He's the director of Archbold's Plant Ecology Research Program, and he's been heading that program since 1988. His main research interests are plant demography, fire ecology, scrub conservation, and restoration. He has mentored over 120 research interns in his time at Archbold, which really is pretty incredible. The question that Eric is about to answer and that all of our panelists will answer for round one is, when you think of the colors of the Florida scrub, what do you think of? All right, Eric, your turn. All right, Dustin. Well, um, what I love about the colors of the Florida scrub is the subtle variety of greens among the different scrub plants and different times of year. And this time in the spring is particularly wonderful because the oaks, turn over their leaves uh, each year, even though the, the plants are evergreen, the leaves only live one year. And so this time of year, you have the older leaves that have been through a lot, and you have the younger leaves coming out. And the younger leaves have this beautiful light lime green color, and uh, they function a lot more efficiently than the older leaves. So just by the color, you can kind of tell what the leaves are doing for the plants and how much energy they're producing from the sun. Thank you, Eric, that, that was really cool. Our next person that we're going to is Dr. Reed Bowman, and he's the director of Archbold's avian ecology program. He works to understand birds and their environments and how humans impact those relationships and how management can mitigate the negative impacts. Reed, you're up. Thanks, Dustin. 50 years ago, I was marching in New York City at Earth Day. <laughs> um, when I think of scrub and the uh, color in the scrub, I think about um, renewal, really, in contrast. Um, the scrub itself isn't really a hugely colorful spot, um, but the colors that do exist there are often pretty intense. And one of the most intense colors, this incredible orange red, is actually not an organism, but fire. And fire renews scrub but paradoxically renews, removes all the color. Um, but go to a fire just a couple weeks after, and you can see some of these very, very intense greens as the plants start to re-sprout. Go back a year and you can see the hillside covered with sky blue lupine and that intense purple blue color contrasting with the charred black of the sand pines. Um, it's really sort of amazing. 
even Florida scrub jays, which aren't really affected by fire directly in that sense, um, are their most intense blue after their annual molt of brand new feathers. And the amazing thing is these colors also have important functions. In, in plants, it may be to attract pollinators. In jays, the intense blue is a signal of social status, sort of like the peacock's tail. Um, so colors actually for each individual species are natural adaptations, but they add to our appreciation of this endangered habitat. Thanks, Reed. And put those put those comments down there too. If our panelists are saying something that inspires you, or you've seen some of these same colors, share some of your experiences as well. The next panelist is Dr. Hilary Swain, who's Archbold's executive director. She's the captain of the ship. She keeps us all focused on the big picture of science, conservation, and education in Florida and beyond. Well, happy Earth Day, everybody. Um, one of the wonderful things about working at Archbold is, and it sounds very, uh, it sounds a bit cliched, but it's Earth Day every day at Archbold. So we're all very lucky to work here from that respect. Um, I thought about sharing some personal reflections and then I, re I realized we don't have Mark Dayrup, our uh, wonderful entomologist here. And Mark has special insights and, uh, into the colors in the Florida scrub. So I thought I would share you his almost Hubble telescope eyes of you know, what the Florida scrub looks like, his vision of what, um, what the, uh, one minute, um, what insects in the scrub look like. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, show you what Mark Dayrup sees. Uh, is that coming up everybody or not yet? Are people see, um, can you wave at me um, if there's a positive? Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. So Mark once told me when I look down a microscope, I just see little jewels, jewels of color. And of course these are the, the scrub and I picked some of his images from that just to really emphasize what he sees. Uh, these are actually um, images of bugs that you can find in the scrub. Um, so uh, if I go across here, let's start top right. If you look closely, this is a green grasshopper. If you look even more closely, it's a flightless green grasshopper. There are many flightless grasshoppers in the scrub. Um, you know, it, it's a habitat where hunkering down on small islands of scrub is worthwhile. But the green is critical because only if you're green can you avoid being uh, detected by predators like Florida scrub jays. To the middle, although many of you may think initially these are the sort of dazzling uh, colors of a dragonfly, this is actually a species called an owl fly. You can tell that because it's got very long clubbed antennae. They're um, night hunters, so although they're colored, they're not um, so brightly colored. This one is not so brightly colored. The little plates here are the reference colors when we take photos of bugs under our dissecting scopes and then ma uh, under our uh, sort of macro scale photos for uh, putting them online. So uh, you and the rest of the public can look at them. I'd love to hear what you think about these as, as we go through them. Bottom left is an interesting one. This is actually a sand roach. And of course, most people think I don't like roaches, but this is a really neat roach. It lives um, uh, un fossorily, in other words, under the surface. It burrows through the sand. And when you pull it out, it has this golden iridescent sheen color um, on, uh, on, on, its, uh, on the body of the sand roach. And you have to wonder, what is the value of that color living underground? Um, on the bottom right, there is an emerald moth. And of course, it's this fabulous emerald moth color. But its colors are even, um, you know, are especially interesting because if you drill down into them, you actually find at the larval stage, it has two different colors. It has brown color and a green color. And those larvae, the little caterpillars of the moth, live on a, a specialized plant, the Florida rosemary. And you only find them on the rag background, brown on twigs, green on leaves. So they're uh, exquisitely camouflaged or protected against their backgrounds. 
So I wanted to really say uh, there are beaut there is beauty in the color of the Florida scrub um, at a at a, a sort of a micro uh, at a scale of a bug. Um, on this one, this is the one of the little green sweat bees. Uh, you can see this iridescent green um, exoskeleton, and you can also see the extraordinarily yellow the extraordinary yellows of the pollen that has been collecting from the catkins of an oak here at Archbold. This one is actually called a brown stripe bee and in another specimen you can see the little brown stripes on the body. To, um, it's a brown winged stripe sweat bee. So on that note I'll stop sharing my screen. If you're really interested somebody's going to put this link in the chat so you can go and search for all of our Archbold bugs. You search under the Archbold collection and you look for ones with images and you can just um, just uh, sit in a splendid glory looking at these fantastic colors um, of the sort of the small the small parts of our community here. Thank you. I just loved that. Oh man. When I think about the, the colors of the Florida scrub, sometimes I forget those those tiny little things that we need a microscope or really good eyes to see. Our next panelist is Vivian Slaughter. She's Archbold's GIS and data manager. She works with the Archbold scientists on maps and data that support their research. Vivian, when you think of the colors of the Florida scrub, what do you think of? Thanks, Dustin. Um, uh, as a map maker, I'm always thinking about the colors that you can see from a map. And so we have this amazing aerial imagery that you can see in your Google Maps or online. And you can see all these different shades on the ground. And uh, in the scrub, there's all the different shades of green that Eric talked about, all the different plants that are these different shades. And you can see bright white sand and different shades of beige, depending on what kind of soils we have, whether it's a white sand soil or a yellow scrub soil. Um, you can also see when uh, a prescribed fire has happened and the landscape is black and charred. And then as you watch that from day to day, you'll see more and more green be brought in and this brightness that just comes on top of that black charredness from the fire. Um, I think it's really amazing to be able to see all of that from uh, from aerial imagery and you know at Archbold we also use drones to capture that information and we can see it at a much higher resolution so you can see it really uh, fine detail and start to distinguish between the different colors and, and of the different species so that is what my, where my mind goes right away when I'm thinking about the colors of the scrub. Dustin, I think you're still muted. Oh, sorry, I was mute. I muted myself. <laughs> Dr. Betsy Bowen is the program director of agroecology at Archbold's Buck Island Ranch. Her work is focused on sustaining biodiversity and ecosystem services on ranches and in the headwaters of the Florida Everglades. Betsy, what are your colors of the Florida scrub? What do you think of? Well, um, since I w mostly work on the ranch, I, I always feel lucky when I get to go into the scrub. And I was actually one of Eric's, one of the 120 interns that he's mentored over the years. And the colors of the scrub takes me back to when I was doing an internship at Archbold. And one of the things that we worked a lot in the rosemary bulbs, so that's sort of the higher drier um, tops of the, the dunes at Archbold and they have bright white sand gaps. So I do distinctly remember collecting data and holding a white data sheet and then having the white sand reflect back up at you and it's almost blinding and very intense. Um, and also walking through the rosemary bulbs, how exciting it was to come across some of the, the flowers that we were studying and they're very tiny. So for example, Hypericum cumulicola is, only has a flower that's three to four millimeters long um, or in diameter. So they're very small, but exciting to find those tiny splashes of color. 
if we have any of Eric's old interns on here, like Betsy, write in the comments, let us let us know. Or or other interns or researchers who have, who have visited Archbold, or if you've never been to Archbold before, put that in the comments too. We just want to know who's on here. Stephanie Kuntz is an Archbold research assistant in plant ecology. She works to conserve rare and endangered plant populations and restore the Florida scrub. Thanks, Dustin. Um, I'm also one of Eric's former interns, and now I've come back um, working with him as a research assistant. Um, but when I watch the color of the Florida scrub, I think about the amazing number of plants and animals around us that we usually don't even take a second glance at. This film really slowed down the world around us, um, highlighting the details and colors that we usually go, don't even notice. But as a plant ecologist um, studying many of Florida's very small, rare plants, it's these details that I look at on a, on a daily basis. The colors of the film tell us a lot about the habitat where we are in, such as where we're in a wetland or up in a pine flatwoods or even in a rosemary scrub. They can also tell us about the time of year, whether it's a spring bloom or a fall flower. They can even tell us about um, how long it's been since a fire. As Reed mentioned earlier, even immediately post fire, as plants start to re-sprout, their colors are very different from when they're fully regrown. And so even these colors are, can tell us more about when a fire last occurred and what stage it is of regrowth. Thank you, Stephanie. The film that she's referring to, if you haven't watched it yet, it shares the same name as our panel talk, Colors of the Florida Scrub. If you go on our Facebook page, we posted it this morning. If you've been feeling a bit stressed or anxious these days, like many of us have, this is the video you've been waiting for, two and a half minutes of just pure nature bliss. We're moving on to round two, where each of the panelists have a specific question directed toward them. So the first question goes to Eric. Eric, what is something about how plants use color that most people don't know? Well, Dustin, most people do know that the colors of, the, of flowers, as several people have mentioned, uh, not only are beautiful, but they're uh, important in bringing pollinators to the plant. And the pollinators are essential to plants because they move pollen and allow the plants to produce seeds and allow the plants to uh, outcross and not become inbred. But besides the general colors of the flowers, there's specific patterns that help pollinators out. And these are called nectar guides. And these are colorful lines that guide the pollinators to their nectar or pollen rewards and allow efficient pollination. But not all the nectar guides are ones that we can see. In fact, many of them are in the ultraviolet uh, um, wavelengths of light. And see, uh, insects like bees and moths and butterflies can see the ultraviolet colors and they can uh, hone in on them and get to the flower in the proper way. And uh, by using photography, we can then see what the insect sees and understand that. These color patterns are, are well known in many cultivated plants and it looks like the color patterns in our rare scrub mint, Dicerana frutescens, probably serve the same function to help the bee fly pollinators efficiently pollinate the plant. Thanks, Eric. Reed, your question is, why is color important for Florida scrub jays? Well, as, uh, as Eric alluded to, um, there are actually more colors in the rainbow than we can see. Um, there are a whole bunch of additional colors that are in the ultraviolet spectrum. The humans can't see in the ultraviolet spectrum, but birds can. So if you're familiar with Florida scrub jays, um, there's one next to me. Oh, look, I can do that. I can scratch his head. Um, <laughs> they are this very intense blue, but the males and females look identical to us but the males and females reflect different spectra in the UV light. So to jays, males and females are very, very different. Now, some animals get their colors from their food, but blue colors come from the structure of the feathers. And, and that takes a lot of energy. So only birds that are really high quality birds in really good condition 
can afford to invest in that intense blue color or the ultraviolet colors. And so blue is actually what we call an honest signal. It reflects the quality of a bird and therefore blue and ultraviolet lights are used as a, as a signal of social status, much like a peacock uses its tail. And we're just now beginning to appreciate how jays use color to advertise their status and the complexities of the social hierarchy as these birds grow and learn who they're competing with, who they're vying with to become breeders. And that feeds into questions about their movements across the landscapes and where they end up, all of which is work that we're currently working on. So color is a, an essential part to the ecology of the Florida scrub jay. Wow, that, that, was, that was great. Hillary, you are next. As we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, what positive changes have you seen for conservation in your career? So I'm going to answer that in two parts, you know, what's happened to Florida, and then I'll give a little personal reflection. So what positive changes have we seen in conservation of Florida in the past 50 years? I'll start off with the, uh, the, the um, obvious comment. I was not here in Florida in 1970, 50 years ago. But it, does, it takes a quick Google check to realize that we had 6.791 million people in the state um, in 1970, and now there are 21 and a half million people. So we have three times more people in Florida than we had in 1970. In some ways, a lot of the big changes in Florida had occurred pre-1970. A lot of the um, significant habitat loss, conversion, a lot of the extensive drainage, um, much of that had already gone in place in Florida. Um, I think in terms of some of the positive changes in Florida, probably the biggest change has been the um, area or extent of conservation land that we have protected, lands and waters that we have protected in the state. Uh, we've gone from the sort of mid-teens in 1970s, a term of the percentage for the state, although that number was a bit hard to find, but now we have 27.4% of Florida um, in conservation status of some form, local, state, or federal. That's extraordinary for an East Coast state. I mean, this is really, uh, you know, in Florida, we should just um, just pat ourselves on the back. Uh, there's still much more to be done, but we have done an incredible job setting aside important conservation lands. Um, I think the other thing that's changed a lot is recognition. People recognize the value of conservation much more in Florida. It is pretty hard to run on an anti-environmental stance in Florida. There's, you know, the vast majority of people in Florida believe in conservation and believe in protecting the natural resources here. So in summary, uh, what I would say is we, and I've used this word, these words many times, we're appalled at what we lost and amazed at what we've managed to save. Um, you asked me, you know, what has happened for my career, just very briefly, there wasn't really much of a career in conservation when I started out, I became a zoologist, I actually chose to go into conservation, so I worked for the British government for a while in conservation, and what I've loved over the arc of my career is how conservation has become really not an option as a career, or really a, you know, not a clear option, to one that, you know, is a, an eminent career for many young people coming up with many many um, variants on that theme. So I would say I followed that arc and been delighted that so many, um, so many more people over the trajectory of that arc have been able to take advantage of the option, uh, possibilities. Thank you, Hillary. Vivian, I think that you have a unique perspective as a map maker and you work with researchers from all different fields. So your question is, if you could wave a magic wand and get rid of one threat to Florida's ecosystems, what threat would you eliminate? The, it's a tough question, Dustin, but um, I, my mind goes right away to thinking about um, how the environment is considered when planning for the future. So uh, as the population grows, development has to increase, our agriculture has to increase, 
Um, and we can actually plan for this appropriately if we look at the maps and we can see from the sky what is happening on the ground. How patchy are we making this environment? Are we allowing things to be conducive for the ecosystem services that we, that we are looking for? Um, I think it's really important to focus on those, uh, the, the maps and the colors that you're seeing within that when you're planning um, for future land use changes. Obviously, as population is going to continue to, to rise, we'll have to think a little bit harder about the places that we're choosing to develop and the places that we're choosing to do agriculture and the places that we're setting aside for conservation purposes. And I think that you can see a lot of that from, from a map and from, from any aerial imagery. Um, I think that there's a, a lot of th things that you can notice in our area when you're looking at maps and trying to plan for the future. And some of that would be these vast landscapes, prairie looking landscapes from the sky that uh, our Florida ranching is done here. There's a lot of ranching that happens on these lands and um, keeping them in a ranch environment would allow them to be able to still um, have these ecosystem services happening and uh, wildlife moving through them um, and uh, while also helping with food production. And so I think that it's a matter of trying to, to leverage what we know and what we need and plan effectively um, based on what we can see and make not too much of a, a patchwork of our landscape. Well, that was a tough question, but you did, did good with it. <laughs> Our next round, which we're not to yet, but our next round will be the Q&A from our viewers. So please keep adding your questions in. I know that I see some of the questions are already getting answered because we have an amazing list of attendees that are helping everybody answer their questions. Keep adding more questions so we've got some to talk about. If Vivian's question was hard, Betsy's I think is the hardest question I've got for the panelists. So, Betsy, on Earth Day 100, right, the 100th anniversary, what do you see as the best outcome for Florida's wildlife, lands, and waters? Okay, thanks, Dustin, for that question. Um, I think in 50 years, huge progress can be made for sustainable water and biodiversity in Florida. During that time, we will see huge population growth, but I think if we can all work together like we have seen and have been doing at Archbold, where we have these unique um, combinations of nonprofits, state agencies, federal agencies, and private land and industry all working together, we can have smart growth. And our collective action could result in the protection of the entire Florida Wildlife Corridor. This is a connected series of protected and private lands that allow for far ranging wildlife species like the Florida Panther to move across the entire length of Florida. And we still have the opportunity to do that and protect that corridor. So I, I hope that in 50 years, we see that come to reality. And I also think that some of the programs that we have going on now, like the one we've been working with the South Florida Water Management District on called Dispersed Water Management, um, if that was scaled up and included both small and large private landowners providing incentives to these landowners to retain water and restore wetlands on their, on their lands, we could see a huge benefit for people and wildlife in Florida. So I would hope to see that program scaled up in 50 years. And if I could pick two things, those would be the two things I would wanna see. And as Viv mentioned in her answer, um, in our watershed, which is 2.6 million acres um, from Orlando to Lake Okeechobee, about a third of that is private ranch land. If we could maintain that, that land use, that proportion of land use in this watershed, that would be a third thing I would love to see for water and wildlife. 
Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Once again, I do want to pitch our Colors of the Florida Scrub video. You can go to our website or our Facebook page and check it out. Stephanie, your question is, what stood out to you the most in the film Colors of the Florida Scrub? To me, what stood out the most in the video was not just the colors, but the amazing variety of uh, textures and patterns as well. Uh, early in the film, we can see the layers of the bark um, from a pine tree. Um, on the scrub jay that you see in the film, uh, we get a close enough view that you can see the different textures and the different flight patterns, but also the down from under, from on uh, the scrub jay's belly. Uh, looking down um, at a Florida rosemary scrub plant, if you've never done that, to me it almost looked like you were looking down on a city skyscraper, or city size skyscrapers, um, such as like New York City, just the angles and the textures uh, going down. Um, there are also other details too, such as the teeth on a saw palmetto. You can see just how sharp they are. Um, I've cut myself many a times on them. But we also get to see the scales in the scrub lizard and the vibrant blue that is right on that side um, behind their front leg. Um, and then also the hairs on the pollinators that you see pollinating um, the various flowers that we see that uh, without, throughout the scrub. Thank you, thank you, that was really nice. We ended up with a special guest on here we have Dr. John Fitzpatrick, our former executive director, who is the current director of the uh, Avian Ecology, or sorry, the Cornell Lab of uh, Ecology, Avian Ecology. And I just made him a panelist too, and we're gonna put him on the spot. So Fitz, can you tell us what you think of when you think of the colors of the Florida scrub? Oh, you are um, muted right now. Oh, yeah, sorry. Thank you. you. Yeah, okay, I'm happy to be here. Honored to be uh, invited in as a special extra panelist. Um, uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, by the way, that's the... Um, so the... Uh, I love the colors of the Florida scrub more than about any place on the planet. Um, been studying them almost 50 years and for me the great thing about the scrub besides the jay of course is the is the diminutive nature Hillary represent Hillary talked about that your your color palette is is has to be subtle and your focus has to be small like think of yourself as a gopher tortoise walking through the scrub and suddenly these big beautiful flowers uh, that are half the size of your head, you know, can take on enormous proportions. So for me, the uh, ever-changing colors of the small flowers of the Florida scrub plant community are what I think of all the time as the, uh, as the great color palette in the scrub. Uh, things from, you know, the, the various collies, the various uh, dwarf huckleberries and blueberries, the little, uh, what is it, blue curls, that little mint that comes out in the summer, the dicerandra that Eric talked about, all of these flowers, the, the um, butterfly plant, the, the different milkweed species that flower at different times, all of these flowers are small, but when you look at them closely, their colors are brilliant, just as brilliant as in a you know, Amsterdam tulip garden, they just have to be thinking small. Uh, and for me, that's one of the things that makes the scrub such a magical place. It's a, it's an elfin paradise. And uh, so if we think that way and see that way, we just see an amazing, amazing array of colors uh, throughout the year. And you're about to get into the active season. I love summer in Florida, because that's when all the life happens and the flowers starts. Thanks, Fitz. That, that was great. We're moving on to round three, Q and A's from the public. We have some questions already, so I'll start directing these, but keep adding them. Feel free to keep adding them. Reed, this one is for you. Are scrub jays related to blue jays? Okay. 
Reed, do you want to take that one? Are Scrub Jays related to Blue Jays? He might be muted. He's muted. He may also have lost his internet. <laughs> well, Fitz. You want me to, yeah, Dustin, you want me to take that one? Please do. Thank you. Yeah, Scrub Jays and Blue Jays are definitely related. They're, uh, they're both in the same family as the crows and the magpies and the nutcrackers. That's the Corvid family. They are in different genera. The Blue Jay's most close relative is the Western uh, species called Stellar's Jay. Uh, but the Florida Scrub Jay is very closely related to a complex of, of a Scrub Jay type birds in Western North America and Mexico. But yes, they are both in the uh, New World Jay uh, subfamily. Thank you. We had a question about rosemary balds. Somebody must have mentioned that when they were talking earlier. It did get answered in the comments, but Stephanie, could you could you give us a little explanation of what's the difference between a rosemary bald and the scrub? Well, a, a bald actually gets its term um, from a type of habitat in North Carolina on the tops of hillsides, you have these open bald spaces. It's bald because there's no trees. And we typically think of the Appalachian Mountains as having trees. Um, so that term kind of got carried down to Florida to where as you move through the Florida scrub, you have this matrix of <coughs> and shrubs or other various shrubs. You kind of emerge on the tops of these hills. You know, hills is a very general term in Florida. But Betsy mentioned working on you as you ascend these small hills. Um, it's dominated by rosemary scrub, which is a type of Florida scrub habitat. And it gets the term bald because they are very high and dry places. And so a lot of our dominating shrubs cannot grow as well there. But also the rosemary plant, the shrub that is um, it, where it gets its name from, um, it has this really unique allelopathic chemical. And what that is, is basically its leaves are able to make a chemical that inhibit or stop germination of other plants so for some species. So it creates these open areas, these sandy openings that look like bald spots on the top of these hills. But it's also in this rosemary scrub habitat where we get a lot of our endemic species that are found nowhere else in the world and only here on the Lake Wells Ridge. Nice, since we've already got you on here, um, there's another plant question you can just do real quick. Are the berries with green and pink blush, are they blueberries or are they huckleberries? <laughs> I'd have to look at the video again, um, but I remember seeing it earlier. I believe that they're blueberries. I don't think they're huckleberries, but I'd have to look at it again. <laughs> the reason that I'm smiling on that one is that people ask me that when I'm giving tours. It's the same thing. Locals in this part of Florida refer to low bush blueberries as huckleberries. Uh, there's another okay. plant that's also called huckleberries and there's yeah. <laughs> blueberries. When we say huckleberries at Archbold, or sorry, when we say blueberries at Archbold, we're usually referring to these very short little blueberry bushes. And if you've grown up and lived out here all your life for many decades, you would probably call it a huckleberry. Hillary, let's direct the next question to you. If someone was going to donate to a place that would help with land conservation in Florida, what is the best place to donate? Well, I'm trying not to appear unbiased. <laughs> But uh, of course, we at Archbold welcome donations. And I noticed someone in the chat had put, did you know that when you buy something from Amazon, you can choose a nonprofit to make all your donations to? So that always makes me happy when I'm buying something from Amazon and do it through Amazon Smile. And I check my little Archbold Expeditions box and I make sure that a donation's going to Archbold as well as 
my purchase. Um, we, we are deeply appreciative of the support we get from the public. Um, thank you very much for this question. And it can help in lots of ways. It can help um, if you're interested in science, it can help us with science. If you're interested in education, it can help us with training school children to interns. If you're committed to conservation, it can help us with our sort of really critical work, sort of pushing conservation of this sort of the Florida scrub and the whole headwaters of the Everglades. Um, I think the other thing is it's always a lovely idea to put yourself in the ni or nice mood before you make a donation. So I would strongly suggest go and watch that lovely video again and just take a deep breath and then think about making a donation because you'll feel even better about it. So thank you. Thank you for that question. It was very kind of you. We have a question about invasive species and let's actually divide this up with two people. So the question is, has the scrub been impacted by invasive species? And I'm thinking Vivian, maybe you could answer that one, but Betsy, could you come in from, instead of just the scrub perspective, perspective tell us from the ranching perspective too. Uh, Vivian, you wanna start? Sure. Um, yeah, so in uh, invasive species are always going to be a problem where there is any kind of disturbance. So um, typically where we'll find it is along road edges on the edges of our property or things like that. And we are actively trying to, to mitigate that and to, to get them um, out of the scrub so that they don't push too far in interior in our property. Um, there's not, it's there, there's definitely a little bit interior, but we're working really hard to get rid of it and to find ways to mitigate keeping it out. And um, a lot of that would be putting uh, different measures in place when people are bringing trucks and driving them onto our property, making sure that they're cleaned appropriately um, so that we can do as much as we can to, to keep them at bay and um, also limit the amount of um, disturbance that would happen in the scrub because that is where invasives are most likely to occur. Betsy, you want to jump back in too? Sure. So at the ranch, um, we have over 450 plant species on our list, and the majority of them are native, about 85%. But we do have some invasive plant species. And some of the studies we have done have shown that they enter through the ditch network and they spread through the ditch network. So one particular plant called West Indian marsh grass, um, we noticed that it wasn't in all of the wetlands, but we would see it in some wetlands and we wondered what was driving that. Why do some have it and some don't? And one of the answers is the ditch network. Um, so the ditches are important corridors for invasive species moving through the landscape. And another species, it wasn't a plant, it's an invasive snail. Um, we had a master student, Stephen Pierre, study why some wetlands had snails and not others. And it was found that the ditch network was important for those species to move through the landscape as well. So understanding, sort of the first step is understanding what's driving the invasion of the, of the invasive species and then um, thinking about what are some management actions that you could do to prevent the spread if, if it's possible. Thank you. We have another Scrub J question and I think, I think we've got Reed with us now. Reed, there's a question about Scrub J reproduction and the cycle of life what is going on right now with our scrub jays? Oh, Reed, you're muted. Got it. We're deep into the breeding season for Florida scrub jays. So typically they would start nesting in early March. Um, many of the birds have eggs or already young jays. Um, we've even had a few that where the young have fledged out of the nest and starting to learn to be on their own. Um, the breeding season will go um, till about mid-June. Sometimes we have young birds that uh, are still in the nest until the end of June. 
but scrub jays, unlike a lot of other birds, have a really extended period of parental dependence. So the young stick around, and they stick around for years, but they're actually dependent on their parents for feeding for as much as 80 to 85 days after they've left the nest. And we continue to monitor the birds through that period as well. Reed, why don't you take this next question too. Has the fire regime changed over time? And if it has, does that impact the scrublands? Yeah, the fire regime has changed a lot. Um, we've, we didn't really begin managing Archbold until the mid to late 80s with fire. Um, so on Archbold, the fire regime has become a lot more frequent. Um, and that's created a structure, a habitat structure, that's more suitable for the Florida scrub jays. Our population of jays at Archbold has been pretty stable over the 50 years we've been studying them. It varies a lot from year to year, but the average is pretty much exactly the same as it, as it started with. Um, now, across the range of the Florida scrub jay, there's even more variation in fire. Again, fire has become a much more commonly used tool in conservation to manage habitats. Um, but there are still places where the fire regime isn't as frequent as jays would like. They like it to burn every 10 to 20 years, depending on how quickly the, the scrub grows back. And so if it becomes overgrown, it becomes less suitable for the Florida scrub jays, and they'll eventually die out. Now, fortunately, it can become overgrown and stay overgrown for a relatively long time, but as long as there's a source of scrub jays somewhere nearby, you can manage it and scrub jays will come back. We've recently seen this in a state park in um, southeastern Florida, Jonathan Dickinson State Park, that had done extensive management, burning habitats that hadn't burned for 40 or 50 years. And that population has grown quite a lot from almost no families to over 30 now. So um, build it and they will come. Thanks, Reed. We're gonna move to our last question in this round. This is for Hillary, but if someone else also wants to add to it, go for it. It's a question about climate change. Uh, it's a little long, let me just read it here. Scrub species, both plant and animal, already live on the edge because they experience such, such extreme habitat conditions. So many of them are habitat specific and don't really occur anywhere else. Do you have any insights into how, how climate change might affect the long-term prospects of such species? Hillary, if you could talk about that and maybe Vivian, you maybe would be good too to, to say something about map making and, and long-term planning. All right, Hillary. Well, try, try and make this quick. <laughs> this could be a book. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the extraordinary things about the Florida scrub is that it, um, it's an ancient system and it's a system that's been exposed to tremendous variability in climate over time. In fact, from Lake Annie at Archbold, we can go back 44,000 years in the sediments at the bottom of the lake. And from those sediments, we can tell which species were dominant, which species came and went, not necessarily always exactly the same species, but at least the genus, when there were oaks, dominance, pines, etc. We know that Lake Annie nearly dried out about um, 11,000 years ago, which just shows you how incredibly variable the climate has been. Lake Annie is actually a window into the past history of climate in Florida. Um, what is extraordinary is you can track those pollen records, and these are a lot of pa papers from Archbold, and see that a lot of things have pulled through this tremendous variation in climate. They may have shrunk and expanded over time. So the system has a lot of resilience in it. The system has a lot of resilience, for example, because a lot of the plants here are clonal. They're not necessarily relying on re-sprouting. And they've had to deal with tremendous variants, variants in fires, variants in drought, floods, you know, you, you name it. There's a, the variance is a characteristic of this system. Even some of our insect plant relationships show that um, there, there, there are very few 
bugs and flowers that are just codependent on one or two, you know, just one bug, one flower. Most plants have multiple flower visitors and most bugs, not an individual, but most species of bugs visit multiple flowers. This tells you as a system of resilience. So what that would tell me is within the breadth of um, anticipated climate change over the next um, decades, we probably have a lot of inbuilt capacity to cope with this variance, except in a few areas. When systems are small and isolated and already under pressure from other factors, habitat loss, invasive species, you know, encroachment from roads, then they are less able to show that resilience. So what would concern me is the, the incredible capacity of this ecosystem. I often describe it like a Swiss bank, you know, with incredible investment that, you know, you're just investing a little bit every year, this ability to pull through enormous change over time. The, the challenge for us is, the past may not be a very good reflection on the f uh, future because the system has lost some of its resilience because of threats from uh, emerging things, disease, new, a new plant disease on oaks could devastate the ecosystem um, uh, and isolation and genetic um, depauperation as, as plants and animals get more and more isolated, they become genetically isolated and are less able to cope with variants. So that was a very long question, answer to uh, actually very difficult question. We are aware of it. Many of these um, plants and animals may be vulnerable. We don't know exactly what, but this is a system that if managed correctly has the potential to be resilient. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. That was really, that was really insightful. I definitely learned some things there. Vivian, are you ready? Yeah, yeah. Um, I I think Hillary gave a really good answer there and it is a very difficult question and um, maps can be used to answer those types of questions and maps hold an integral role in the studies that are done to try and look at that. So you would kind of combine the climate science and predictions moving forward to see how the climate will change and you can see that on the map and then join that together with the type of information that we're collecting at Archbold, the demography on all of the different species. And we have that for a lot of years. And so we can see how that's changing. And so when you put those together on a map, you can start to build models to try and understand what is going to happen um, as, the, as the climate changes. So uh, there's a lot that, a lot of science that goes into the type of um, work to understand that question. And I think it's really important that the work that we're doing at Archbold holds such a big role within that. You, um, Thanks, it, uh, it might be worth asking Reed if he'd like to comment on it. He's looked a lot at timing of breeding for jays and thought about the implications for resource access with jays and uh, potential climate change, particularly variation in rainfall. Well, we know we know one thing that affects the jay, the timing of jay breeding a lot is the El Nino cycle, and one of the predictions for Florida is that our weather will get more extreme. Um, so it's not necessarily directional change getting hotter, 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 but um, it may get a little hotter, but in short bouts of intense heat or intense rain or intense drought. And that likely is to affect the timing of breeding for the jays. Um, the real question are, the will the resources that the jays depend on shift with the climate as the jays shift. Um, so elsewhere in the world, a lot of people have found that birds are changing their timing of breeding, but some of the resources they depend aren't changing at the same rate. So um, it certainly will have an impact on the jays, um, but we don't yet know what that's going to be. We certainly know where it's likely to influence them. Thank you. I have to remind myself that I'm the moderator because I just get absorbed in all the answers <laughs> to the questions. Uh, but it's 425, so let's move on to our final round. This is going to be a quick round going through all our panelists again. Eric, Eric had to leave, but we do have Fitz here too, so Fitz will have to answer this one. The question for everybody is, what are you thankful for on this Earth Day? And we'll start with Reed. Uh, 
Well, I, I guess I'm thankful for all the progress that we have made. It certainly seems like things have slowed down a little bit, but um, you know, it's really interesting to see pictures around the world while people are sheltering at home and seeing vivid blue skies in India and um, short-term changes uh, that have happened just in the last few weeks, months, that make me think that everything's a lot more resilient than we think it is and gives me greater hope for future accomplishments in terms of protecting the environment and, and mediating climate change. Hillary, what are you thankful for this Earth Day? Well, I'm going to turn my camera around and say I'm thankful for this view <laughs> of the Florida scrub that I'm looking at right now. Um, on a more philosophical note, um, I'm very thankful for the beauty in nature because that's what inspires me to keep going. And uh, it's still there. You just, it's right there at your doorstep. You know, it doesn't matter if you live in an urban area or a suburb or a wilderness area, nature is around you. So I'm very grateful that we can all be uh, inspired. And it's that level of inspiration that is really important because otherwise you can just sink into paroxysms of despair. So that's what I'm grateful for. Enough inspiration for nature to absolutely keep me going. Vivian, you're next. Um, I am definitely grateful for uh, places like Archbold that are available to continue to learn about the environment and provide a platform to be able to share our knowledge so that we can make good decisions moving forward. Um, and also to tie into what Hillary said at the beginning, um, I am thankful that conservation is a, is a good career option that is available for so many today to, to help make good decisions moving forward. Betsy, what are you grateful for this Earth Day? Um, I'm grateful for the rich biodiversity that surrounds us and it continuously fills me with wonder and discovery. And there's little things that I'm doing right now to sustain biodiversity in my yard. Um, so recently we, purple, we planted some purple passion flowers and I love seeing the Gulf fritillary butterflies coming to them right now. So just thankful for that opportunity to encourage biodiversity in my backyard. Nice. Stephanie, what about you? Uh, kind of the same theme of I'm just really happy that or really thankful for that we have all these wonderful natural areas around us uh, available for us to explore. Um, even just walking, you know, in my neighborhood in some of the undeveloped lots looking and seeing that there's rare species in our backyard and that is really cool. Not everybody can see that. Um, so I think what this video really brought forward that kind of reminds us to be thankful for what we have around us. Um, and just take a little second and maybe slow down and look and see at those little flowers that everybody talked about. Um, there's a lot of beauty out there and I, especially in this time of isolation, it's nice to, to find what's, what's really still there. Beautiful. Fitz, you wanna jump in on this one too? You're muted. Sorry. Am I unmuted now? We have a phrase we've taken to use around the lab, which is that we, we place hope on the wings of science. Um, I've been connected with the land since I was a small kid in, in a rural part of Minnesota. But I'm super grateful for the fact that in, in very large part, thanks to the early experiences I had as an intern at Archbold, I got turned on to the idea that we can ask questions of her, of, of the earth, and that we need beautiful, great places in which we can answer them. And since 1972, I've been able to spend every, parts of every single year at that beautiful spot that Richard Archbold had the good fortune to uh, establish in the 40s. The idea that we can continue to unravel the mysteries of how nature works at spectacular places like Archbold, I'm ex exceptionally grateful for that real privilege. 
Thank you. In the comments, Shafali said, Dustin, what are you thankful for? I hadn't thought about it before. And this is, this is going to sound, you know, self-serving or something, but I'm grateful for the panelists that are, that are here today, not just because I'm a moderator. I'm not a researcher myself. My, my background is in fine arts and I found myself with the coolest job on the planet, which is somebody who's a communicator and a storyteller getting dropped down into a community of people, of professionals who spend their entire careers and much of their other parts of their lives learning about nature and protecting nature in, in Florida. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so that's, that's what I'm thankful for. Not just the panelists here, but people all around the world that are doing that. I'm going to wrap us up here. So thank you for our, our panelists for taking the time to do this. Thank you everybody who has attended today and who's put comments and questions in. Tomorrow is our next Zoom event. It's an agroecology intern seminar by Hannah Van Zant. Sugar, spice, and everything nice. A comparison of pasture and sugarcane water and nutrient dynamics during the first year of planting. If, you, if you've heard about water quality issues in Florida and wondered about sugarcane and its role in that, Archbold has now started to research that. And that's what this talk is going to be about, our first year looking into this. Joining on these interactive virtual field trips and virtual presentations is a really great way to stay connected to Archbold. Thanks for doing that. Here's some of the other websites you can go to, our Facebook, YouTube page, to learn more about what we do. If you're not subscribed to our e-newsletter, the newsletter for Curious Minds, go to our website and find the newsletter section and put your email in there. I highly recommend it. It's once a month. It has five short stories about things happening at Archbold. Of course, we also appreciate our volunteers. Archbold has about 75 volunteers, so it's much larger than our actual workforce. And becoming a financial supporter keeps us going too. Archbold is a nonprofit, so we very much appreciate the, fin the financial support for the people who can do that. Thank you all for joining us. This, is, uh, this has been recorded, and we'll be putting it up on YouTube either today or tomorrow. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dustin.